Hey everyone. Dave. Welcome. Welcome to the Environment for the Americas Bird Book Club. We'll let people continue to come in and we'll wait for just a moment or two to, to get officially started. But as you're joining us, please um, put into the chat where you're joining us from. And I will let you know that I am joining this bird book club from Madison, Wisconsin, which is a new, a new living place for me. A couple of folks from New York. I see a couple faces or names that I'm recognizing. Feel free to turn on your camera so we can see your shining, smiley faces as we get started. No pressure, but we always love to see faces. Thanks, Anne, for lighting up the camera in your world. So we have some people from Washington, from Ohio. Oh, Anne, you're from Ohio. Minnesota. We'll just wait just a, a couple minutes while folks um, get on and join us. We are gonna have a fun conversation this evening. We are uh, have the pleasure of Joan Strassman joining us this evening and she's written Slow Birding. So, and as you can see in my typical fashion, I have a lot of pages marked with lots of questions and things that I wanna know a little more about. Hey, Roger, thanks for coming on camera and joining us this evening. Got some folks from Texas and Arizona. And again, we'll give just we'll give folks just a few more minutes to join us. And as you're joining us, welcome to the Environment for the Americas Bird Book Club. Let us know where you're joining us from. Where are you sitting tonight? And feel free if you'd like to turn your camera on. We love to see your smiling faces. We know that's not always possible. I had a meeting earlier today with a, with a colleague of mine and his children came home from school and immediately rushed into the room to tell their papa hello after a hard day at the, at the school. And, and he was concerned and I'm like, no, no, I love it. I love to see the children. And love to see pets. If you have a cat that walks across your screen. Welcome, Lisa. I love your blessed by birds. And Carol Myers, welcome. All right, Daisy, what do you think? Should we give people 30-ish more seconds or so to, to, to join us? Sure, Alicia, we still have people coming in. Uh, so one minute, maybe, yeah. Okay. Yeah, sounds good, thank you. Victoria, thanks for coming on camera and joining us this evening. Nice thank to see you. you. Nice to see you. So yeah, as you guys are coming in, feel free to let us know where you're joining us from. And Barbara Jones is just up the road in Windsor, Colorado. The Plains, Virginia. I used to work in uh, the DC area and I'm familiar with the Plains. We had our American Bird Conservancy office in the Plains, Virginia. All right, so I think we'll let Daisy work her magic to let people in as they, as they join us for this evening. Thank you everyone for coming to the Environment for the Americas Bird uh, book club and my name is Alicia King. I am your host this evening. So I had um, a real fun time reading Slow Birding. We're going to have a fun evening with Joan Strassman. So um, as you're all settling in and getting started, I understand you may need to turn cameras on or off. It's helpful if you do mute yourself so that we don't hear background noise or so that if you know the the FedEx man comes to your door and the dog starts to bark. We're not hearing the barking dog. <laughs> That's always helpful to have a little bit of quiet. Um, 
let us know um, where you're where you're joining us from. And I'll ask a few questions as we go through. And as you have questions this evening, please pop them into the chat. I'll either call on you to ask you to ask your question of our of our author this evening, or I will um, ask the question for you. It depends on, on how it's going for the evening. So first, I want to start with a background for Environment for the Americas. I see some familiar names and faces, and so you probably know all about Environment for the Americas, but I would like very much to give a quick little PowerPoint presentation so that um, we're all kind of on the same page. So bear with me for just a moment while I share my screen and get that part of the evening started. All right, and I'm hoping that you all can see my, my screen. It says, welcome to the Bird Book Club. Can I get some thumbs up or nods that you guys are all able to see that? Okay, thank you. Thanks, Roger and folks. I appreciate knowing that you're actually seeing what I'm seeing. So this is an Environment for the Americas Bird Book Club. We like to be able to gather people together to talk about really cool things related to birds and the world of birds and um, appreciate your reading the book, buying the author's book, and then joining us. So if I can move to our uh, topic this evening is slow birding. So Joan Strassman has written a really cool book that I enjoyed reading a lot, The Art and Science of Enjoying the Birds in Your Own Backyard. Um, fascinating things to learn and discover about the birds in my backyard. So, um, Joan is, is an author of sorts in many ways. She um, is currently, uh, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Joan, a North American evolutionary biologist. And she's um, a Charles Rebstock professor of biology at the Washington University in St. Louis. She earned a BS in zoology from the University of Michigan and has distinctive honors, especially in zoology. Um, and she has a PhD from the University of Texas at Austin, um, which she got in 79. She has joined the uh, facility at, or faculty rather, at uh, Rice University in 1980, becoming a department chair. And she um, joined the biology department of Washington University in St. Louis in 2011. She is known, well known for her work in social evolution and particularly how cooperation prospers in the face of evolutionary conflicts. So I loved reading some of her book and um, knowing that about her. I wanna tell you a little bit about Environment for the Americas and how we work together to really unify our voices for birds and their conservation. Everything that we do at Environment for the Americas is meant to engage people, to share information, learn more about birds, learn about their habitats, and learn about how we together as communities can, uh, can help birds and be great conservationists for birds. So we use global data, we use local data, we work with local organizations to do surveys um, at many, many levels so that we have some data and science um, related to the birds that we're trying to um, really um, engage people on and really um, think about the ways that we can do great conservation things. Environment for the America attends a lot of conferences and does a lot of things related to, again, getting the word out and then networking and working with folks in the conservation field. We create a lot of educational materials and do a lot of community outreach. Many times that's bilingual. We have, do a lot of things in French and Spanish and other languages as we are able to do that. And that's one of the ways that we really connect with local communities. We also um, have interns. So we work with interns on a regular basis with other organizations. I work for the Forest Service. I'm in the Forest Products Laboratory in Madison, Wisconsin. And one of the things that um, Environment for the Americas does is pay interns to work with other groups and organizations and agencies 
to really help facilitate their becoming great conservation folks in the, in the birding world. So a lot of things that just scratches the surface of what Environment for the Americas does. One of the things that Environment for the Americas is well known for is the World Migratory Bird Day. Um, previously, it was International uh, Migratory Bird Day. And now we have expanded to the world, working in coordination with um, the Convention of Migratory Species and the Agreement and the Conservation of African Eurasian Migratory Water Birds. So together and with other organizations at a local, regional and national level throughout the world, we really celebrate the phenomenon of bird migration. And it really helps us um, think about the call to action to help the protect, protect the birds that we share. So all of the things that we do are incredibly important in engaging people and getting the word out. And this year, our theme, every year the World Migratory Bird Day has a different theme. This year, our theme is um, water and just thinking about the sustainability of water as it sustains the life of birds and us and how it benefits the health and well-being of our whole world. We do a lot of work with other organizations and specific things that are related to, again, you know, that conservation theme. But we um, work with the um, West, Western Hummingbird Partnership and that across boundaries is so important for us to really think about what's threatening hummingbirds and what happens to benefit them. So we're raising awareness through trainings, public events, workshops, and those sorts of things so that we just you know, really reach as many people as we can. There are a lot of ways that Environment for the Americas reaches out to people and we write a lot of grants and we ask for money. And we also have a shop, Daisy actually runs our shop. Thank you, Daisy, for getting all sorts of cool stuff and wearing one of the scarves that's in the shop. Um, but one of the ways that you can help support Environment for the Americas is by shopping. So you know that when you go shopping, you're doing really cool stuff, really uh, supporting a cool organization. We have a lot of educational materials as well as some really cool things like glasses and plates and scarves and books and just amazing things that, um, that you can give as gifts at any time of the year, of course. But the in educational material is, um, is really exceptional for what we try to do and is available for you to be able to share with schools or if you're giving talks or if you're traveling anywhere, you know, taking those, those tools with you. So go shopping sometime really soon. And you can be a friend to, with us. You can share with your friends and you can stay in touch with us. Follow us um, on our social media um, platforms follow us on and look at our webinars. And of course, you're here for the Bird Book Club. So thank you for that. That's another way you can support us is by being visible and sharing information with your friends. And at any time, you can reach out to us and ask questions, you know, thinking about things that you, you know, maybe you have an idea of something you might want to do in your community. Give us a call, reach out to us and let us know what you're thinking. We, I, my role at Environment for the Americas is as a volunteer, I, I have a day job that I have to go to, um, which I of course love, but I love doing volunteer work for Environment for the Americas and hosting this bird book club is one of the volunteer activities I do. And I'm sure we can find activities for you all if you're ever interested in volunteering for Environment for the Americas. But I wanna share with you, our next book is called Flight Paths. And Rebecca Heisman has um, written a book just pretty much hot off the press. <laughs> and so um, with that is gonna be our next Bird Book Club, um, March the 30th. So if you wanna join us again for that, we'd love, we'd love to have you. And so I appreciate your uh, patience as I walk through that. Again, I just wanna make sure that for new folks or folks that aren't as familiar with Environment for the Americas, that you do um, kind of know what we're all about and what we're doing. Thanks again for joining us. Let me just remind you, if you wanna put in the chat where you're joining us from, 
make sure your mic is muted so that we're not hearing background noise or things that just might unexpectedly come up. And then your chat button should be at the bottom of your screen. Zoom is always changing, so um, bear with me if I say something that might not seem you know, the same way on your, on your Zoom screen. But down at the bottom, you should have a chat if you open that up. You can see where people are joining us from. You can also put in questions or comments or thoughts as we walk through this evening. And, um, and then feel free to you know, do a reaction if you wanna have any kind of reactions. You can you know, share with us that you're thinking, oh, I love that or whatever it might be. All right, so this evening, again, we have the pleasure. Um, Joan Strassman has joined us and she has written a lovely book slow birding. And as you can tell from my speech pattern, I'm a pretty fast person. And I love just this whole concept of thinking about how do I slow down and enjoy the birds a little bit more. And Joan, as I was reading your book and thinking about, you know, the questions that I wanted to ask you, you have, um, the way you designed this book was beautiful because you have your chapters organized and you have that kind of list of things that we can do to, in, to increase our enjoyment in our backyard as well as other places. And I thought about um, some of the words that you have in your book, benefits, advantage, survival, success, enjoyment. And those seem to kind of be throughout your book and particularly enjoyment and the, the reinforcement of slow birding. So without any more chatter from me for now, I'm gonna introduce Joan. And Joan, tell us a little bit about you and a little bit about your book. Well, I do have a little PowerPoint if you want that. Um, I'm a mom, I'm a teacher, and I just love getting outside and, and sharing things. So that's who I am. I have had an international past. I've lived in a, quite a few countries, including Mexico as a little kid. So knowing Spanish at a high level has benefited me a lot. And uh, the book came out of my my love of teaching, not from my research, which was on wasps and uh, social amoebas. So it's a little unusual. Most academics don't write books about their teaching, but there you go. So here, I'll just uh, see if I can share my screen. No. Is that what you're doing? Are you Let's see. I pick share screen and then slide the PowerPoint. There we go. I love that we can be all over the country watching you and listening to you. <laughs> and I'm I'm in Nashville. I'm gonna give a couple of talks at Vanderbilt. So I was like, nope, actually I can't go out to dinner tonight. So I had <laughs> my my travel dinner of a microwaved sweet potato and a can of sardines. Oh <laughs> so anyway. Well thank um, you for being with us. <laughs> it's my pleasure. Yeah so people wonder uh why did I write this book? Why did I write it at this point in my career? I've now been a professor for like 40 years. And it's always really been for me about the students and inspiring the students. And I feel like my professors gave me a lot and I want to give that back to the next generation. Um, are you seeing the banner up above? Let's see, maybe that's better. Um, so slow food is actually, slow birding is from the slow food idea, which is from um, a protest in Italy in, in I think 1987. 
protesting a McDonald's going in by the Spanish steps. And it's now grown to be quite a big movement celebrating local natural foods. And so I thought, oh, we should celebrate local natural birds also. So that's uh, kind of where it came from. So thinking about my students, I wanted them to really watch birds, see the details, see that this, uh, this American coot is picked just one of his chicks to feed. Here you can see that this one has a little label on it. So I started out asking the students to just answer three questions. I showed them three birds species on campus, and this was back when I was at Rice. And the first was how do birds use time and time and space? And this, of course, is something that we can all answer. We can, and you just answer it by watching and trying to understand. And then I asked, well, how does that differ between the sexes? And that was a bit of a trick question because two of the species I gave them, you couldn't tell the sexes apart. So they struggled with that and that was good. And then my third question was simply, what else do you want to know? And so this was a very slow and experiential course. And we then went on to have the students actually write on a blog, which I started, uh, yeah, in November of, of 2010. So a bunch of students wrote for that. So I really wanted to get the students involved in things. Um, I never thought I'd actually write this book. I'm, I've got it right here. I brought a copy. It's just like amazing to me that after talking about it all this time, I actually wrote it. So I know you'll probably have a bunch of questions. I just wanted to share my artist is Anthony Bartley. And he was a undergrad at Washington University. He's in Chicago now. He does such amazing art that I never even occurred to me to ask him, but then he, mm -hmm. he got a job with the ob -GYN department at Washington University School of Medicine. I thought, wow, if he can draw that stuff, maybe he'll draw birds for me. And so he did the illustrations and I just want to give him a shout out. He's, I haven't bought any of his <clears throat> paintings, but I'm going to. I guess if I needed to say a couple more things, one is probably you all know about Merlin and, and have it on your, I don't even know why we call these things phones, you know, but yeah, this life organizer that we'd be dead without. Uh, Merlin is a great app. I use it all the time to learn the songs. And then I just love logging things on eBird. And I feel like I want to give back and being a citizen scientist and showing what I've seen where is just uh, really important to me. So I'll kind of leave it there, and I'm happy to talk about the book, the birds, or anything else that you want at this point. Thank you so much, Joan. And I don't know if you want to go ahead and stop sharing just so we can see folks' faces if they want to come on. And I think I had said, for those of you that joined us a little bit later, feel free to turn your cameras on. We love to see your smiling faces. Um, so Joan, I am not seeing any questions right now in the, in the chat, but I do have, and as you, this is my typical style. I put my, you know, lots of little tabs in here and then I have to think, okay, which questions do I want to start with in case I don't have enough time? But um, one of the things that you say in your book is that you have logged 73 species of birds in your, um, in your backyard. And that's your backyard in the St. Louis area. Is that, is that right? I can't remember if it's in my backyard or in the little park that's a block and a half away. Um, it's Flynn Park. It's got a tennis court court, it's got an elementary school, has some oak trees, it has no shrubs, it's just 
you know, your most boring possible kind of city park. It's about two acres or four acres. I can't remember, but it's small. Anyway, yeah, I just feel like if you go to the same place over and over again, like this year, we've got a little flock of rusty blackbirds and I see them almost every day. And I think this is the first year I've really had them. So yeah, it's fun to have one little place. Yeah. So I was thinking about, you know, 73 species and I'm like, uh, so I've just moved into a new home in Madison, Wisconsin. And uh, I think I'm up to about 21 bird species that I've seen in, in my yard. And one of the things that you recommend at the end of a lot of your chapters is for folks to keep a journal and write things down. And how many of you raise of hands or, or emoji or put in the chat, how many of you um, keep a journal of the birds in your yard? Whether you, I see Jeannie, Katie, mm -hmm. number of folks, Anne. So in, I'll, I'll raise my hand because I do a, a journal. I'm not always real good about it, but one of the things that um, you point out in your book and you just kind of alluded to it is, you can learn, wow, that's a bird that I haven't seen, or it's a bird that um, comes back every year in September, or, you know, like the juncos maybe are showing up, you know, in, in, um, you know, in the later fall, or maybe they come early a couple of years, what's up with that? And I love that you ask people or tell people to consider eBird, putting, you know, their, um, sightings and eBirds, that's one of the ways we um, can really look at what's going on with birds and how are they moving and are they coming earlier or going later or bigger, big numbers, what's, what's going on with them. So um, any numbers out there, folks, you wanna put in the chat, how many, what your bird list is in your own backyard? So I can tell you something about Madison and that is, uh, Sylvia Halkin studied uh, Northern Cardinal songs there in her graduate school days. And just recently she's gone back and listened to the songs and found that there's some differences in the way that the birds in Madison are singing over the 30 or so years since she was a grad student. So she gave a talk on that at the uh, American Ornithological Society meetings last summer. So yeah, so take a hard listen to your, your Madison Cardinals because they didn't used to sound like that. <laughs> interesting, interesting. I know that when we think about birds throughout the country, um, you know, they do have a little bit of a dialect difference depending on where they are in the country. And uh, I used to tease that the Southern birds had a little bit of a Southern accent. <laughs> and it's not very nice of me, but. <laughs> um, the other thing that you mention in your book um, on the, the Blue Jay chapter, you talk about state birds and the, um, the, um, the Blue Jay isn't a, a bird listed a state bird. Isn't is, that terrible? <laughs> that's really funny, especially because the cardinal, oh, I can't remember. I have it written here somewhere, but you said the cardinal has like what, seven or eight? Cardinals, mockingbirds, meadowlarks have a whole bunch of states and not a single state has the blue jay. It's yeah, so funny. it's sad. It's sad. No, they get no respect. Everyone <laughs> Googles them. They're one of the top birds people Google. But yeah. And that surprised me also the list of, yeah, Google. Um, what was it? You had, it was um, Blue Jays placed sixth as one of the most Googled birds. And then wild turkeys, bald eagles, common ravens, mallards, and ospreys were the top. I'm anybody else just kind of curious about the whole Google thing? I just thought that was fascinating that that those birds, I mean, I would have thought the more common birds would have been Googled more or even like hummingbirds or something, you know, unusual. Uh, 
And then just so you know, Joan, we've got a couple comments about people doing eBird. So yay, more power to you guys. Thanks for doing, doing the eBird. That's, that's um, helpful. And then Katie says, a true example of slow birding in my area. Um, in Northern Perula, Perula, if I could talk, uh, of the year exactly in the same spot on her nature trail um, as it was the year before. And she says, yeah, I the, did an eBird, of course. Well, the birds have started singing in St. Louis. I mean, the Cardinals have started singing. The Juncos, of course, the Juncos aren't going to breed in St. Louis, but they've just been kind of hovering around and eating all winter. And now they're starting to fly after each other and they're singing. And uh, yeah, it's uh, spring is coming. <laughs> You know, I moved from Washington, D.C. to Alaska, and I had to really get used to the reversal of the juncos. Like, you know, when I was in the lower 48 in, in D.C. and Indiana and, and other areas, it, the juncos were a, a sign of, of winter. And I was like, yes, it's winter. The juncos are here. And when I moved to Alaska, I was like, wait a minute, the juncos are here. It's not winter, it's summer. Yeah. So Jill Boyce says that she loves your emphasis on deepening your understanding of your local birds. The opposite of what I sense, what I sense is a, com a competitive race for species tallies. Yeah, I, you know, I, I call those guys motor birders and I am of course guilty of it too. I love running around and looking at birds, but I, you know, I just read one of those big year books and I, I got to the end and the person saw many birds and I got to the end of it and it was a great adventure story. But then I started thinking, did he, cause of course it was a he, no offense guys. Um, did he tell me a single new natural history tidbit about a single one of those birds? And don't we get so much more out of the birds by actually seeing what they've done? And, you know, I'm not an ornithologist. I'm a consumer, an avid consumer of all the results that these great people have, have done. And my one thing that was fun about the book was the really private stories that people would tell me about how they actually did the research. And uh, yeah, I just feel like those stories should be out there. And uh, I also feel that if, if there is to be hope for this world, we academics have to not just teach the facts, but teach where they come from because it's only with those tools that people can say, oh, this is likely to be true because it's got some, you know, evidence behind it. And this does not. I mean, to me, that is a more important thing to teach than any given fact. And I'd rather teach a quarter the facts with all their background. So, yeah. I like to tell the stories. <laughs> Thanks you, for that, Do you Joan. have a question, Victoria? Do you have your hand up? Yes, ma'am. Um, hi, I'm Victoria, and um, I thank you so much. Your book is incredible. I enjoyed reading it. Um, I really enjoyed the chapter on Blue Jays and how um, it, you mentioned that the Blue Jays will try to eat monarch butterflies, but because the butterflies have um, those toxins in them from when, um, well, I know like from monarch caterpillars, for instance, they have those glycosides in them because they consume the milkweed. So for instance, when the blue jay tries to eat a monarch caterpillar, the bird becomes very sick and um, you mentioned how a scientist, um, biologist named Lincoln Brower um, studied how um, the blue jay would eat a monarch butterfly and it would become sick.
because um, the butterfly contained those toxins. And I just thought, wow, like the monarchs must be kind of distasteful. But that's sort of like um, a defense mechanism for the monarchs. Right, it is. Yeah, it was very hard for him to do that test. And by the way, the, the Blue Jays were fine afterwards. I mean, they were they spit them out and they were they were fine. They just learned not to mess with the monarchs anymore. Right. Yeah, but exactly. I really enjoyed that part because my family and I have actually raised and released monarchs in an outdoor butterfly habitat. So what we did was we planted milkweed plants. And then when they got eggs on them, the monarch female butterfly would lay her eggs on the milkweed plants. Then we would take them and put them in the outdoor butterfly habitat, which is like netting. And it's um, a safe place for the eggs to hatch and be protected from predators like wasps and stuff. And so then the eggs hatched and formed caterpillars and then they ate on the milkweed and they formed chrysalis and then they emerged as adult butterflies and then we released them and it was so incredible that's so nice thank you for sharing yeah um such a I fun also, project to do <clears throat> yes so we have a couple other questions or thoughts going on thanks thanks victoria for, thank for sharing your your love of monarchs <laughs> um we have a couple other questions in here. So Pamela is asking if um, well, she'd like your insight on feeding birds versus planting for birds. Um, you know, I'm really, I, I will give you my opinion, which is basically, yes, all of the above. My, my yard is wild enough that I get cited at least once a year by the city. Um, the, our, our little city does allow wild. I just have to convince them they're not weeds. But anyway, yeah, so I do lots of planting for birds. And I think planting is great. But anything that brings people and birds together is good. And I, I think, you know, I'm okay with feeders as long as we follow whatever the rules are at this point for avoiding uh, bird flu, which seems like it's, it's uh, yeah. So I'm not the expert, I do both. Thanks for that question. That is something that people do ask, um, you know, and I think, Joan, you mentioned this uh, throughout your book, it, you know, that natural habitat or that habitat that encourages birds, you know, um, to come to, to not only your backyard, but perhaps a local park or another place and supplementing the birds. The birds don't become dependent on your food source. So supplementing with bird feeders allows you to bring those birds in a little closer, allows you to maybe study them a little more. Um, you know, allowing you that that closer look, and it's and it's fun. You know, one of the things that somebody says, and that let's see if I haven't lost this. Um, uh, oh, Allison, hi, Allison. Thanks for joining us. She appreciates that you worked science into the appreciation of birds, and so you do that so lovely. You just you know the the um, little things that we might be wondering about birds. And you bring that into the discussion so that we can appreciate that a little bit more. And that's, I think, you know, part of your point of slow birding, slow down, watch these birds, look at these cool things that the birds do um, that you might not notice if you're one of those motor birders or just, you know, looking at the, at the, um, you know, the bird feeder and go, oh, yep, yep, cardinal, uh, chickadee, um, downy woodpecker. Yep. Got it. As opposed to relaxing. So it's, I've read a lot of books about nature. I've just, I read all the time right now. I'm kind of obsessed with a mystery series, but anyway, um, the challenge for a scientist is to not write a dry book that just has all the kind of facts about the birds 
And so it took me a long time to conceptualize the book and to realize that I did not know how to write this book and I needed to learn how, I do know how to learn things and I needed to learn how to write it. And um, so some of my friends who have read my book have said, hey, Joan has written a behavioral ecology textbook here, sneaked in among all of this other stuff. But really, and it's true that, you know, I had a list of concepts that I wanted to show up in that book. And, you know, I didn't want it to be a dry book. I've read lots of dry books. I've read lots of books on writing. It's like, there has to be an arc. Oh, what is an arc? I don't even know. And I realized then I really wasn't that good at art. So that's why we have, you know, bird by bird. And then, you know, I realized they, they say, well, there has to be a narrative voice and there has to be a kind of protagonist to the book. And I was like, oh, well, that's kind of embarrassing. I guess it has to be me. Um, so then, you know, putting in the personal stuff felt really um, embarrassing at first, but then I kind of got into it. And even my science friends have said, that they like the stuff that's not the science, <laughs> but, you know. So I, I had, you know, I had, I had three things. I had my experiences with the birds. I had the ornithologist's own stories about the birds and about studying them and what it felt like to studying them. And then I had the facts about the birds. So I I really always had for each bird those three things in mind and tried to um, meld them. You did a, a lovely job. I, um, I love that you go to the a well AOU meetings. <laughs> I'm dating myself by saying AOU. <laughs> but the... Um, and in fact, I remember the one in St. Louis years and years and years ago. But the um, I, I, I love that you mentioned the American Ornithological Society meetings and other meetings similar to that, because you can, um, you know, go to those those papers and, you know, learn the little bits and pieces. One of the first ones that I went to um, years ago talked about chickadees and how chickadees determine which seed to take from the feeder. And it's yeah. fascinating. Yeah. So there's a question on binoculars. Mm. And um, I have two kinds that I use. I have some eight by 20s that are little and I have with me all the time. And, you know, I went down to Texas to, I'm, you know, lived in Texas for 35 years, went to High Island and I had those and I got ridiculed um, because they're such little binoculars. They were very good binoculars. I also have, so I have a eight by 20 or 10 by 25. And then I also have a, uh, a uh, rather nice pair of um, 10 by 40s, which work better in dim light. Um, the Audubon Society has a page on binoculars. It used to be that getting the cut right and the coatings meant that it was really different how much you spent. I think these days you can get a really good inexpensive pair of binoculars for, you know, one to 300. Um, and I'll tell you, I was, um, I took a course from one of my former students. It was a camping course called Vertebrate Natural History all through Texas. What he did, what he said was he needed really cheap binoculars for his students. And what he said was the really cheap ones are not collimated. So what collimated means is that the two eye holes look at exactly the same place. And you can tell if you just hold them up and focus on a line, you know, could be the edge of a building or something, and that line should meet. And so what he did was he went to, I don't know if it was Target or Walmart or 
you know, some very inexpensive store. And he would just get the binoculars out of the box and see if that line met, because he said they don't do quality control, but some of them are good. And then he was buying like $35 binoculars for these students that at least lasted for the month of the course. So I just, I don't know. I don't, I don't stress too much about <laughs> these binoculars. I mean, you know what they always say, right? Is that the best binoculars are the ones you've got with you. Um, so you'll get a headache. If the two eyes don't point in the same place, You, I get a headache. But other than that, the Audubon page, I think it's Audubon Society has a page, you know, you've, for different price price points. And um, yeah, so I would just look at that. I just, yeah, I'm not a binocular snob at all. <laughs> well, and to your point, Joan, what binoculars feel good for you? You know, people have different faces and different um features and so go someplace where you can look through different binoculars and and if you, you have glasses binoculars. the some kind of depth matters okay so someone asked about pushback on the more invasive research i describe um so i can tell you that i did not talk about any research in which birds were killed um there have been some negative, there's a person who uses the term slow birding and thinks she used it before me, but I have used it since 2010, so that's not actually true, who's criticized the some of the things. Some people think bird banding is invasive. Um, there was a study of house sparrows, which are actually not a protected species. You can squish them legally. I would never do that. Um, putting little weights on their feathers to change the cost. Um, other things, I guess Ellen Ketterson put uh, juncos overnight in a uh, incubator to see how much weight they lost. Oh, what else was invasive? Yeah, I mean, taking little bits of blood. I'm the kind of person that when I studied wasps and at the end of a month, we killed those wasps, I felt terrible. I felt, I just, you know, I had nightmares. I felt terrible. You know, I, there was zero chance I would not write up those papers because I felt I owed it to the wasp God. So um, some people think we shouldn't even ban birds. and. I do a lot of bird banding. I feel like with understanding comes compassion. With understanding, we find out what it is that birds need. Um, at the the last AOS meetings last summer, we're in uh, Puerto Rico, and uh, there were a lot of talks about um, neotropical declines in birds and what was causing them. And, you know, honestly, if you don't catch and banned birds, there's just so many things you're not going to find out. I mean, anyway, so, so yeah, um, yes, there has been some pushback on, on some of the, I, I, I'd be curious if you wanted to tell me what exactly you had in mind, which invasive thing caught your eye. Well, it wasn't me. This is Roger Everhart. Um, it was a discussion over the book. I, I love the book. I thought it did a, a great job of describing what science is really like. Good. But um, I guess it was the one, I think it was the rail chicks that they took the plumes off uh, and the parents would stop feeding them. Oh, the coots. Coots, right, right. Yeah, they are in the rail family, of course, yeah. 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 So um, that was one that, that they thought was... Uh, uh, you know, mean, unnecessary, whatever. But um, I, I, my personal opinion is I think a lot of people don't understand the process of science, but they also don't understand how hard the natural world really is, that it is not a Disney film, you know? And so I've, I've 
tried to convince some people that had that to, to go ahead and read the book anyway, and because they're hearing it from other people and, and so on. Um, but I, I know that it's sometimes hard to advance you know, your research without having an impact. And so that that's part of the game. Yeah, so the, the Coots, I mean, so the Coots story is really interesting. So what happens with the Coots, and this is, um, this is Dai Shizuka and Bruce Lyon's work. And what happens with the Coots is um, other females lay in nests that are not their own and the parents want to only take care of their own chicks. And so, um, so there's this tension about how the parents decide. And so there's always more coot chicks lay eggs that are laid than will be taken care of. And what the parents do is they imprint on the very first chicks that are laid and on their patterns, and they kind of all look the same to us, but not to them. And then as they're, when the later ones come along that look different, those will be from the, the um, other females that just laid in the, in the nests. And they, yeah, they are, those chicks don't get cared for. So the, the, the coot parents at first, they feed the first hatched babies. So this is another thing that, quite a number of bird parents do. And that is, if you wanna rear all your chicks, they only lay one egg a day, you lay one egg a day, you don't start incubating till they're all laid. Then you start warming them, they develop, they hatch all at once. If you want your chicks to fight and sort it out for themselves and only rear some, maybe you've you know had eight kids and you can only rear five unless it's a really great year, then you start incubating after only you know one or two or three have been laid. You are setting your chicks up, the later ones, for death. That's what the birds have evolved to do. And yeah, it's horrible to see this little chick, you know, not getting fed. Uh, and you're right, it's 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 biology. And if our main goal were to save the birds, then understanding exactly when and how that happened could inform, for example, management decisions to reduce it if that were our goal. So for example, with coots, they nest in the fringes along lakes in the reeds. And if you wanted a management plan to reduce that kind of competition, you would space out the areas where you you had the good nesting habits habitats for chicks, for example. So I, I think we need to understand what our goals are and what the birds are doing. And yeah, that can't always be done without any kind of experiments. But you know, I work on wasps and I work now I I've worked I work on an amoeba and honestly I, I don't really actually lose any sleep over <laughs> amoeba. I mean the amoebas yeah they die but they're kind of immortal because we have clones so we have them in the freezer so they're you know they're 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 immortal in in that sense. So yeah, so I don't have to personally face any of these tough decisions. You know, Joan, you, you bring up a great point about our need to understand birds so that we can think about, um, you know, the conservation efforts. And, the, you know, you've mentioned uh, throughout your book, the use of eBirds and just, you know, um, the science that you have shared with us in all of your chapters is very valuable in us knowing you know, what do we need to do to protect these birds whose lives we impact um, on a day-to-day -day basis with the things that we do? You know, you had mentioned um, predators it, when you were talking about, well, you had, you know, your chapter on, on Cooper's hawks and the, the habits of these birds have changed, not only just because situations change, but because we as humans have changed the situation for them. 
and we've introduced things that might not have been um, a, a problem for them originally. You know, the glass buildings that we build, the the way that we do, um, you know, plant non-native species, or the fact that we've introduced cats into an environment where they're not <laughs> not native. I, I mean, just you know, all sorts of things impact those birds, and to better understand them. You know, we do have to do some research and some considerations for them. At the beginning of, of our bird book club, I had mentioned some of the words that kind of, you know, um, continued throughout the theme of your book, the benefits, advantages, survival, success, risks. And you mentioned some of those things um, in your book. And you also mention a couple invasive species that you, um, you know, were doing slow birding. You mentioned European starlings and they're absolutely stunningly gorgeous throughout, a, you know, um, part of their life. You know, they're sparkly and they're just gorgeous even though they're European starlings. And same with English house sparrows, the way that, you know, we, they're, they're thriving here but not in their native native lands. Can you speak a little just to, to that um, kind of emphasis? So, you know, I debated whether I should include these two common birds in my neighborhood. And, uh, you know, I have really truly hated starlings and just felt like they were evil incarnate when they're knocking a woodpecker out of its nest and all. Um, if you look at this, if you look at the data though, we are so much worse and that the starlings and woodpeckers actually don't, one doesn't do better when the other does worse. They both do better when humans do uh, are less are less uh, harmful. So that was, um, yeah, and starlings are super smart. Um, and then, you know, I have a, f a friend who works on them in Africa. So yeah, starlings are complicated. And uh, as I say in the book, they've been here a lot longer than my uh, ancestors. Uh, so house sparrows are interestingly not really a problem because they're only in the towns. And so they are not going all through, you know, through nature, you know, and if we abandoned a city, the house sparrows abandon it too. So that uh, I spent a sabbatical in Oxford and birded uh, uh, Christ Church Meadow. And the only place there were House sparrows was right along some apartments that had feeders in the back. So I saw, I saw the differences. Then in St. Louis, we have the uh, American tree sparrow, which is a house sparrow that has a little brown spot on its cheek, and it's you know really treasured, even though it's also invasive. But it just didn't spread very far, and it's not that common. So. Um, invasive species are a challenge for our time, and they are plants, there are insects, there are so many different organisms. There's, you know, I uh, have a cottage on Lake Michigan, and the damage that has been done to that lake is just, yeah, from the mussels and things. So, yeah, I just think we have to know what we're doing. and not lose hope either. You know, we have to stay positive. Sometimes it's hard. So. When I think sometimes that's where slow birding comes in because we can really enjoy the birds that are in our backyard. We can enjoy the things that we, um, you know, that we have in, in our yard and we can create um, environments that help us enjoy the birds that are visiting our, our spaces. I know I'm looking forward to my new place and doing that here, just, you know, planting a variety of native plants, always plant a pollinator garden, and then think of, you know, what's gonna, what are the goldfinches gonna eat, you know, as they go into, you know, their later nesters and, you know, they eat a little differently than some of the other seed birds. But um, 
I am, I am so grateful, Joan, that you wrote this book and that you included these fun things in, in the book, things that we can learn about and things that we can share with others. And um, we, we only have a couple minutes left. Is there anything you wanna share with us before we say goodnight to all of our Bird Book Club members? Well, thanks for thanks for being there for the birds. It's uh, yeah. Let's document everything with with eBird and as much as you can, and share with the with the kids. Um, yeah, I just I just uh, love the birds. When I worked on wasps, I loved the wasps, but the amoebas I work on now just don't get me outside. So. <laughs> That is what really brought me to pay a lot more attention to the birds. So, yeah, the ornithologists have figured out so much. It's just really fun to read what they've figured out. So thank you so much for inviting me. Absolutely. We are so glad to have you here. I'm, I'm going to try to sneak in one more question, so um, Joan, because we have two minutes left. Um, Somebody is asking about English, how sparrows interrupting and competing with Eastern bluebirds and specifically in Michigan. I think they compete with bluebirds. I think they compete with tree swallows. I, th I think there's no question that they do, but they will only do that close to human habitations. So if the nest boxes are far away from town, you won't find the house sparrows. Yeah, and, and Joan, I think you'd agree that there are a lot of great organizations out there that can help people. If you've got bluebirds um, boxes, if you're doing a trail or participating in some way, Eastern Bluebird Society, there's a number of organizations and folks that can help you specifically address some of those issues um, related to having a successful bluebird trail or, or nesting box situation. And Joan, you're getting tons of kudos and wonderful and a blessing, blessings hearing you, wonderful book, appreciated the conversation. Um, so this, I think this would make a really great um, gift for folks that that you might want to suggest slow down a little and do some slow yeah. birding. I, I should just say, I've been to Ecuador. My son did a gap year there. Yeah, my son-in-law is Peruvian. Um, my daughter-in-law is Brazilian. So we do get to South America quite a bit. That's <laughs> nice. Yeah. yeah. Um, and for those of you that might not be seeing the chat, that's um, a response from Lisa, who has joined us from, from Ecuador. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Joan, so much for sure. joining us. Thank, Thank you for inviting so much me. For writing the book. We <laughs> um, are very appreciative. Good luck in your presentations tomorrow in Nashville, yes. Tennessee. And um, <laughs> thanks, everybody, for joining us. And we will see you all next time. <laughs>